Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the sixth event in our Maryland Climate Matters series. I'm Yvette Lewis, and I'm chair of the Maryland Democratic Party. Tonight's event is titled Climate Change and the State House. Maryland legislators are united and ready to act. We will discuss the environmental legislation from our last session and look at opportunities to build on that work in the upcoming session. First, I'd like to thank our panelists and our fabulous moderator who will be in introduced in just a few minutes. Our Maryland Climate Matters series would not be possible without the vision and support of Ed Hatcher and Angie Cannon. We are so very grateful for their support. We are grateful for their work to bring awareness to the climate crisis. And I would also like to thank Arnold Richmond. We appreciate all that you do. Your support makes these events possible. Finally, thank you to everyone joining us here on Facebook Live. We are so happy that you've tuned in to hear from the legislators who are diligently working to stem the tide of climate change. We appreciate their sustained efforts to create a greener, healthier future for all of us. Before the panel begins, I would like to invite Erwin Rose, Chair of our Environment and Climate Crisis Committee to make some brief remarks. Thank you, Erwin. Thank you, Chair Lewis, and good evening, everyone. I'm very excited about tonight's event, which has been a key priority for the committee which I chair, the Maryland Democratic Party Environment and Climate Crisis Committee, which brings together Democratic leaders and activists from across the state. We started this committee for two reasons. First, Democratic Party engagement is crucial for progress on environment and climate related issues. At the same time, the success of the Democratic Party depends increasingly upon integrating a strong environment and climate justice agenda with our other top priorities. I was a member of the US delegation at the recent UN climate negotiations in Glasgow, where governments made unprecedented climate commitments. We need international cooperation to solve this global crisis, but the commitments made in Glasgow must be implemented at the federal, state, and local level. We must move at the scale and speed required to protect Marylanders from the impacts that are already underway. Scientists warn that we are at the tipping point that all but guarantees increasingly severe extreme weather events, climate chaos. The UN Secretary General called the latest scientific assessments a code red for humanity and said that the alarm bells are deafening. Extreme storms and heat waves, flooding, coastal erosion, and other climate impacts are already taking their toll on Maryland. Climate change affects everyone and it hits the most vulnerable communities hardest. So this is a key element of our commitment to equality and justice. The business community increasingly recognizes that the climate crisis may cause a widespread financial crisis, triggered for example, when insurers may no longer be willing to cover real estate along the coast or in other flood zones. The stronger and faster our response, the better chance we have to minimize the damage. The good news is that smart climate policy brings immediate benefits, such as clean energy jobs, reduced energy costs, and improved transportation options. Tonight's event shows that climate and environmental issues are at the top of the democratic agenda in Maryland. Our democratic legislators are advancing strong legislation, as you will hear tonight. We need a democratic governor to move us forward more aggressively and more quickly. These issues will be pivotal in the 2022 governor's race. I invite you to join our committee to work with the Democratic Party to support climate action. Thank you. Erwin, thank you so much. And thank you for all that you do for the Maryland Democratic Party. We really appreciate it. Our moderator this evening, Kathleen Matthews, needs no introduction. Kathleen was the chair of the Maryland Democratic Party from 2017 through 2018. She was a successful news reporter and anchor on w WJLA for 25 years and worked for Marriott International as chief communications and public affairs officer. She's also a trustee of the Maryland Democratic Party, a member of our finance committee, and a very, very good friend to all of us here at the party and here in Maryland. And we are thrilled to have her joining us tonight. So Kathleen, the floor is yours. Kathleen, unmute. 
They always warn us about that, don't they? Um, it's great to be with everybody tonight. And we have a truly dynamic uh, panel for all of you um, uh, tonight. This is, as Yvette said, the sixth in a series. So many of you may have joined some of the earlier uh, conversations where they talked uh, specifically about the Chesapeake Bay. They talked about transportation issues. They talked about what's happening in our cities. This session really is focusing on the upcoming legislative session, which is so critical because it is going to be a year when we have a lame duck Republican governor and we have a real commitment on the part of the House of Delegates and the State Senate to actually get really impactful legislation through. So let me just sort of set up the uh, context before I um, uh, introduce our esteemed panel of uh, three members of the House of Delegates and three members of the State Senate. First of all, my own passion for this issue. You know, when I was a TV reporter at Channel 7 in the Washington area, I was really interested in climate change, what we call global warming at that point. And I would constantly put forth stories for our newsroom in our morning meetings, trying to get them to talk about it. And everybody would tell me, and this is going back 10 years ago, oh, people don't care. Their eyes glaze over. This is not an issue we can cover in television. This is not, you know, a front burner issue. Well, so much has changed in the past decade. This has really become a front burner issue. In fact, perhaps the front burner issue for our country, our state, and also our planet. So we have a three-pronged context for the conversation tonight. First of all, we do have the upcoming uh, Maryland legislative session and this unprecedented commitment to actually really work together collaboratively to get things done, which is very exciting. We also have the national context, the federal context, which is the Build Back Better legislation. And it will be making unprecedented investments in addressing climate change. Everything from conservation efforts, incentives for electric cars, uh, for other um, renewable energy, as well as addressing the impact of climate change on our cities and on uh, low-income people. And then we have the um, national context, which Irwin talked so well about. And of course, Irwin, Irwin was and his role at the State Department, a delegate to the uh, COP26 meeting, the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference. And that conversation in Glasgow also had an unprecedented movement forward with nations actually in the final hours agreeing to work together collaboratively on climate change. So this sets the context for our panel. And in the conversation, we're gonna kind of ping pong between House and Senate members, but let me introduce everybody right now in alphabetical order. First of all, we have Delegate Kumar Barve from District 17, which of course is Montgomery County. Give us a wave, Kumar, so we see you as I introduce you. Thank you. We have Senator Sarah Elfreth from District 30 in Anne Arundel County. Hello, Sarah. Senator Paul Pinsky from District 22, um, largely Prince George's County. Delegate Stephanie Smith from D District 45 in Baltimore. Hi, Stephanie. And Delegate uh, Dana Stein, District 11, Baltimore County. And Senator Mary Washington from District 43 in Baltimore City as well. Great, great panel. Uh, so um, as we um, talk about this, I'm gonna sort of, uh, introduce them again in the context of their roles on this important um, debate and on this important legislative agenda. Um, uh, but really what I want everybody to talk about is sort of how climate change is really affecting their constituents. Because we have people from Baltimore City, Prince George's County, Anne Arundel, um, Montgomery County. They also can talk about Southern Maryland, Western Maryland, Eastern Shore. So we're gonna cover sort of the impact to people who are on this um, Zoom right now and on Facebook Live so that uh, people are, you know, they're talking about what's happening in your communities, but also talking about what they think is doable, what can get done and what will complement, hopefully, the passage of the Build Back Better federal legislation. So Senator Pinsky, let me just start with you because of course you chair the Senate Education Health and Environmental Affairs Committee. Um, uh, and you have said you're committed to working with the House of Delegates and really trying to get some really impactful legislation through. What do you think of the priorities at this point from your perspective? Thank you, Kathleen. You know, the, all of you watching understand the severity of the problem, uh, more severe storms, flooding, hurricanes, heat waves in the Northwest and sea level rise. 
But even here in Maryland, uh, there, there are other aspects of, of this climate change that, that are affecting us. Uh, farmers are having what's called saltwater intrusion. They're actually losing acreage where they can grow crops because of the salt water. We have businesses in, in Annapolis, which uh, Senator Elfrith will talk about, and Baltimore that can't open their doors on days when there have been flooding. So it's very real. It's affecting all of our communities. So we really can't wait. That's why we want to, or I need to say that we actually must pass legislation in the upcoming session to address climate solutions. Not tomorrow, not next, next, not next year, but now. So among the policies we're talking about at a, at a 30,000 foot level is first of all, setting a goal to reduce emissions. Uh, we're talking about 60% reduction by 2030 and for our state to be carbon neutral by 2045. Uh, we think we need to electrify the state's fleet of, of cars and school bus across the state because the state needs to lead by example. We, we can't expect other people to change their behavior and practices unless the state of Maryland does it first. Um, another area that is important and we see it all over the state is shifting our building stock, our commercial buildings, our, our residential homes, our multifamily um, away from polluting sources of energy to relying on electrification, uh, which can rely on wind, solar, geothermal. We need to do that. That's where a lot of our savings will take place. And, and through all of this, a special emphasis has to be on communities that have been disproportionately affected by climate. And that's obviously black and brown communities um, who've been in some cases voiceless. And they've been the recipient of the emissions and they have the, um, the asthma and everything else. So we have to make sure that we invest the right amount of money to change those situations in our urban areas. Um, you know, we also need to create an urban conservation core. Uh, a lot of our conservation has been in rural areas along the Bay. We have to shift that and also have a conservation core of young people in urban areas who can work on sustainability and, and climate change. And, and, and finally, you know, as we change energy, it's going to affect our, our workers and our unions. And unfortunately, in some cases, it might displace some of them away from uh, high quality, high paying jobs. And we have to start a constructive dialogue and develop a plan where we make that transition, where working families can, can make a decent living, can, can pay their mortgage, can pay for college if their children uh, choose to go that way. So there's a lot we have to do and, and our, our approach going forward is uh, multifaceted because it's a multifaceted problem. So I'm very optimistic. I'm excited to work with the House that this year we can pass a very significant uh, piece of legislation that puts Maryland in the top tier of states across the country. Well, that sounds great. Um, Delegate Kumar Barve, I saw you listening and smiling. Uh, uh, Delegate Barve, of course, is the chair of the Environment and Transportation Committee in the House of Delegates, um, uh, has been uh, focused on the environment for a long time, responsible for banning fracking, uh, um, offshore drilling. And as you looked um, or listened to Senator Paul Pinsky, um, Delegate Barve, tell me what you were thinking. Do those sound like the priorities? Does, it, does that sound like a, a doable to-do list uh, for 2022? Well, I was kind of mad that he was stealing my speech. Um, <laughs> you know, the fact of the matter is that uh, we have been working very closely together between the House and the Senate over the last several months. And it's our goal to have uh, a victory for the environment that is truly, um, truly a national and perhaps global in its reach. Uh, we really want to go big on the environment this year. And uh, Paul is exactly correct. It's not uh, two years from now or three years from now. We need to start implementing the first laws next year um, to have a, to be a great basis for our progress. You know, I, it's um, it's interesting. Um, when you think about the way the American economy and the world economy is transitioning, uh, the fact is that getting away from fossil fuels over the long run will mean less money expended by consumers and businesses. It means a cleaner environment. And in the case of urban, um, urban jurisdictions especially, not just the city of Baltimore, but also DC and, and places throughout the state of Maryland, 85% of the pollution that people really inhale comes out of the tailpipe of vehicles uh, to a very great extent. And so our plans to advance the electrification of the state's vehicles 
and create a market for, for that kind of transition in the private sector is really part of the whole market conversion that we want to lead. And finally, I, I do have to say that one of the largest, uh, it depends on how you count it, of course, but uh, one of the largest consumers of, of energy are buildings, state buildings, schools, um, you know, private sector buildings. We're taking that issue head on. Uh, we really want to make sure that we get out of the cycle of having, having a building be constructed to use fuel oil or natural gas and then be locked into being a pollution source in effect for the next 40, 50, 60 years. We have to begin the transition to clean and cheap electrification as rapidly as possible. And that's these are among the goals that we have. But really the most important thing I want to emphasize is that the House and the Senate have been working very closely together and we will continue to do so. And it's our it's our expectation that we will have a gigantic victory for the environment uh, this session. Right. Well, Senator Mary Washington, I saw you also smiling there. Um, uh, you, of course, represent Baltimore, and I'm sure you're going to want to talk a little bit about the impact on urban areas, but you also serve on environment health and environmental affairs. So um, feel free to talk about sort of the broader context outside of your district. Um, are, are, are there other priorities um, beyond the ones that we've been talking about, or how would you prioritize them? You know, it, it's wonderful to be here. I, first, I just want to thank Chair Lewis uh, for bringing this panel together and our sponsors and also just having a wonderful uh, moderator and you, Kathleen. It's great to be here with my Senate colleagues and the House colleagues. And um, I share your passion uh, for the environment. I was raised uh, going to parks and, um, you know, sort of exploring the streams. And I, I think my family were environmentalists and we didn't really know that. I just know that the outdoors and breathing air is just something that's always been a value to me. Uh, and being a member of, of Education, Health, and the Environment, um, the Joint Committee on the Chesapeake uh, Bay and critical areas, and um, a member of the Baltimore's First uh, Sustainability Commission, this has just always been something uh, that has, has been dear, near and dear to my heart. And I think for everyone that's on tonight and listening, uh, we know that climate in Maryland is comprised of many, many factors, and what they do, as you say, impact our communities, our schools, and our businesses. And so, um, you know, one of the things that is, is really clear uh, is that climate change does pose an existential threat to our environment and to our public health and to our economies. Um, so these, this is something that is not uh, just simply ideological or something that's happening in 2030, it's happening now. Um, our state has more than 3,000 miles of shoreline, uh, over 260,000 acres, 65,000 acres, that's less than five feet above sea level. So our coastal communities like Annapolis, uh, like Baltimore Inner Harbor, um, uh, many other areas are absolutely uh, impacted. So I wanted to just raise um, a couple of the, the two issues around uh, temperature extremes uh, that are happening as a result of climate change. Um, Charles County has experienced the largest difference uh, in warmer uh, in the state, uh, and also Allegheny County has experienced the, uh, the largest mm. uh, cooler uh, impact. Um, and in addition to, to uh, temperatures, uh, there's also been increased uh, precipitation. Uh, Baltimore City, okay, so the city I represent, has it's the wettest that it's ever been and has the largest uh, difference uh, in change in precipitation uh, in 2020. Uh, and, and Washington County has had the largest difference in drier. So this is clearly uh, a statewide issue. And just to, if I may, just to bring it really home around the wet uh, issues in my district, the 43rd district, heavy rains in a short period of time has caused major flooding. Uh, in this area of 35th and Hillen Road, um, you know, which is near a um, um, you know, main thoroughfare. Uh, and it's, it's, this issue has been going on since 1950s uh, and it's only gotten worse. And thanks to a city state partnership uh, and, and uh, my colleagues, uh, Maggie McIntosh and others in the house and also in the Senate, uh, the state has pledged a $5 million grant, which will begin to address uh, and fixing some of those problems. Um, I just, the, the, so it's not simply flooding uh, on our roads, but in, in my district, 
it, it is affecting the basements of our seniors, of our homeowners. And I, I just want to quote um, Ms. Pamela uh, Waller Williams, who said, we're getting too old for this. Somebody should have done something about this a long time ago. Really, <laughs> they should have. Um, and so I know we're beginning to address that, but our, our constituents want us to do something now. Um, we've got legislation that's aiming to ensure uh, that uh, Maryland legislators and Maryland officials are working on controlling increased stormwater runoff. Um, the Department of Environment has to incorporate uh, precipitation data. Um, and so some of these are components of legislation that we, we passed uh, in prior years, but I'm, I'm really excited that a lot of these components are gonna be a part of our climate solutions now path, um, whether it's to plant trees, um, making sure we have environmental justice um, uh, components. Uh, but the two things are we're getting, uh, there's these parts of our state are getting much wetter, parts are getting much drier, parts of our state are getting much hot, hotter, and parts of our state are, are getting colder. So it is clearly, it is absolutely um, a statewide uh, impact. Thank you so much. Um, as I said, I'm going to ping pong back and forth. And so let's go back to the house to uh, Delegate Stephanie Smith, um, also from Baltimore City. And um, I know you're a new member of House Appropriations, which might have to make sure that some checks get signed to uh, pay for things like environmental justice and the kind of legislation we're talking about. Um, but you also worked on the federal level, which is so interesting because I think there's a critical role here uh, as the state moves forward on the kind of legislation we're talking about to uh, coordinate with the, the, the federal government on what the you know components that'll be in the Build Back Better. So um, why don't you talk a little bit about your federal experience and sort of how you see the two working together? Thank you so much, Kathleen. And I also want to just um, echo the sentiments of my neighbor, um, Senator Washington. Thank you to the party and to the chairwoman Lewis for you know pulling this together. Um, I think what I've been um, really pleased about this series is that it has discussed climate change and environmental justice as one. They are interwoven. So that's been something very gratifying. As you mentioned, in a prior life, I did work on federal um, Clean Air Act um, regulations as well as those that pertain to climate specifically. And to be frank, it's been a horrifying past four years seeing much of what I worked on being <laughs> undone and vandalized <laughs> by the prior administration. So it's very, um, it's very gratifying to have a partner in the White House for the work that all of us, you know, in this Zoom are very committed on because we know that um, there's obviously a public health part of the conversation. So we know EPA is going to be really present in that, but through the Build Back Better, um, you know, um, kind of portfolio, uh, we realize that there's a strong workforce component to climate resilience and adaptation. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to ensure that all of the things that we just talked about involves making sure the new buildings we build are more efficiently operating um, to, to also ensure that, you know, when we look at um, stormwater, um, a lot of these other type of efforts, that, that's infrastructure too. That's putting people back to work, ensuring that um, we have resil more resilient waterways. And then there's also this um, other component about economic and environmental justice. I think sometimes think people think of environmental justice as, as just social justice, but it's also economic justice. The parts of the state and in Baltimore City specifically that will be the hottest will also be home to some of the poorest individuals in our state and city. And what that means is that they will be not only more uncomfortable, but any underlying health conditions that are informed by their um, poverty will be exacerbated and worsened by being exposed to heat. So to have a partner in the White House that understands that you have to actually invest in people to protect the environment, is critical. And I, and it's also um, important, you know, we have the health conversation, we have the workforce development economic conversation, but as someone that has spent their entire life living in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, I grew up at the ocean, I now call Baltimore home, this is our natural heritage. It should be just the same point of pride as a proud Marylander or a proud American, that your natural heritage is vibrant, that that the, um, the life that we have in our waterways is not toxic or harmful um, to human consumption. These are things that should be points of pride as well as economic drivers. So I'm really heartened to have the partnership and the vision um, down the street um, in DC that we haven't had over the past four years, but I think it's up to us 
who are closer to some of these issues to make sure that we are giving that informed direction to our federal partners about what it means. Um, for example, there's a really great um, NOAA um, grant out that is about um, informing environmental literacy on the ground to ensure that community members, particularly those most vulnerable, actually can be conversant about the threats they're experiencing, but maybe don't discuss and frame in a climate or environmental context. I think that there are similar efforts that we need to take at the state level to um, inform partnerships between communities, our higher education community, around adaptation, around resilience, because it's really all hands on deck. It's an emergency. Not one sector can get this squared away and not one level of government can get this done. It will require a team effort. So thank you for the question, Kathy. Yeah, Delegate Smith, thanks so much. Um, Delegate um, uh, Dana Stein represents uh, Baltimore County and is vice chair of the uh, House Environment and Transportation Committee. Um, and uh, Delegate uh, Stein, I know that you've uh, been concerned about the sea level rise, um, uh, you know, and a, a number of initiatives. As you look at the priorities you've heard so far, what, what's kind of a front burner for you right now? Well, I guess I well, you're right, Kathleen. Um, I have been concerned about sea level rise, and you know the, the the fact that Maryland is one of the most vulnerable states to to uh, to climate change because we are such a low lying state. And working with Senator Pinsky, we passed legislation that tries to protect us against sea level rise, storm surge, the saltwater intrusion that farms are farmers are experiencing. But I think what's most important is that. This coming year in Annapolis, we have to pass legislation that takes us to the next level in terms of the reduction of our emissions across a number of different sectors. I mean, it's just so essential to get to the point where we can say that buildings, new buildings are gonna be decarbonized, that they will be electric, that existing buildings have to uh, at some point get to net zero. And you know, it's, it's, it's important as, be it in the building sector or in transportation, um, in other areas that we do everything possible to, uh, to achieve major reductions in the emissions that are coming, out, <clears throat> coming, uh, coming from the state. And you know, the threat is, is um, you know, as uh, was mentioned earlier, we used to think that, well, maybe 10 years ago, this was just sort of a far-flung environmental threat that wasn't going to affect us very much, but we know it's here. It's, there's growing recognition there's a, there's a public health effect. When, um, when Baltimore has <clears throat> the highest temperatures it's had as it had last, last July that it's ever had on record, we know that the effects of climate change are here. We know that vulnerable people are directly affected by the, uh, by the increase in temperature, by the increase in storms or, um, in, in, uh, in precipitation. So, you know, now is the time to act. Our young people are saying that we, they, they will not tolerate, they, they demand action now, not putting it off any further. And also our president is, is calling on all states to act as well. He has said that in addition to the, the climate actions that he's put into the Build Back Better uh, legislation, that states need to be in the forefront of fighting climate change for us to get to our national goals of reducing emissions by 50% by 2030. So it's important for all these for all these reasons, public health, environment, as, as well as supporting our president, um, that we take action. And I'm very hopeful that next year we'll have major legislation that will once again establish Maryland as a, as a leader in this area. Great. Thank you so much, Delegate Stein. And the final <laughs> uh, panelists of our big six is Senator Sarah Elfreth, who I was so proud was elected while I was chair of the party um, from Anne Arundel County. And she's on the Budget and Tax Committee, but also serves on the Chesapeake Bay Commission. Um, I, Annapolis, we, we know those pictures of the, of the tide coming up Main Street, um, the devastation in, in your district, uh, tornadoes. T tell us what the priorities are from your perspective for your constituents, as well as for the whole state. Well, thank you so much, Kathleen, and, and thank you to our chair and, and the party for having this really important conversation. Um, my district, in many ways, has been ground zero for climate change. We see it in 
uh, nuisance flooding that occurs over 50 times a year that can shut off peninsulas. I have the privilege of representing a district of peninsulas, but it poses significant emergency response and economic hardship. Um, when we see sunny day flooding in my district and across across the state. And yes, we've had two tornadoes in two years, which was not a problem we've had before, which I think paints a picture that the climate is changing much more rapidly than we had anticipated. Um, now, my colleagues have done tremendous work and, and tonight highlighted some of the 30,000 foot responses from the General Assembly on the causes. So getting to renew, you know, higher degrees of renewable energy and creating family sustaining jobs here in Maryland, um, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, which we will get done in this next session, um, passing a bill last year to plant 5 million trees and, and focus much of that planning in communities that are historically overburdened. So communities that have that higher temperature that really need the benefit of you know, the green infrastructure of tree canopies. So we're, we're moving in a great direction. Some of the, the bills that I'm working on for this upcoming session, um, we passed a resilience authority bill two years ago that deals with the infrastructure and building more resilient infrastructure uh, here at the city dock, just right down the road from me right now in Annapolis, but also in places like Ellicott City, in Charles County, Dorchester County, Baltimore City. So really addressing infrastructure there. Um, Senator Katie Frey Hester, I want to amplify her work. She's done a tremendous job um, on trying to get a chief resilience officer, uh, a bill to get that passed uh, and established at a cabinet level, because often um, resilience is a cross section of, of emergency management, DNR, MDE, planning, state highway. Um, and we really need one czar, one, one office that is coordinating our response proactively and, and, as a, and, as, and responsively. Um, for instance, you know, we wanted to bring in perspectives from across the state. Um, I represent South County, so I have a very purple district. Um, and a very rural district in many, in many parts of my district. Uh, the flooding that we had over Halloween, the fourth highest on record that we've had, it got up past the market house in Annapolis. It cut off many of my peninsulas for eight plus hours and families were stranded on one side or the other because we have one way in, one way out roads. And so how do we proactively look at what are the most vulnerable pieces of our infrastructure, roads, hospitals, schools, and, and proactively go out and address those because we need to prepare for the fact that we're going to have 100 year floods every couple of years. So really proactively addressing that infrastructure. Uh, we're going to have do a tremendous amount of work on land preservation, um, which is ultimately going to help uh, reduce our built environment and absorb some of some of the, the rainfall that we're going to see in increased measure. So Delegate Lukey and I are working on a 30 by 30 bill to preserve 30% of the state of states, our state's land by 2030, and then see how we can get to 40 by 40 thereafter. We're working on a state parks investment commission bill to do, do a lot with our state parks, but one piece of it is how do we build more green and blue infrastructure in our state lands to better prepare and use our state lands as, as they're supposed to be, frankly, you know, to sp be sponges and absorb some of the impacts of climate change. Um, Delegate Smith and I are working on, frankly, a renewable energy equity bill. How can we uh, incentivize rooftop solar on affordable housing units and make sure those benefits, the benefit of that, of that uh, uh, reduced uh, utility costs go to the families in our districts that need it the most, need that help, and get us to our renewable energy goals altogether. Um, Delegate Stein and I are working on, and uh, Delegate Love are working on a Conservation Finance Act. How do we bring in the private sector to help with stream restoration and forest buffers? And again, that blue and green infrastructure that we're going to need that existed 400 years ago before we built up our infrastructure here? How do we get Maryland back to that place so we have a little more equilibrium when we do experience what we know are going to be increased um, severity of storms, be they floods or, or rainfall, or in my district's case, tornadoes. So um, I'm excited for the work that we have ahead and proud of the work that um, I've been privileged to be a part of in the last three years of this term and cannot wait for a democratic governor and have a partner in, in this work. Uh, soon. 
Great. Um, we've got about 15 minutes to kind of uh, um, tackle a couple of uh, issues in a little more depth, and then we really want to get to questions from our audience. But let me just, um, several of you mentioned, you know, we, we want to reduce emissions, 60% reduction in emissions target, according to Senator Pinsky. Um, you know, you can do that on the state level by requiring uh, your state cars to be electric, uh, to uh, regulate emissions and uh, energy use in your state buildings. But you're really gonna require a lot of partnership with the private sector. And Sarah just talked about the private sector in her comments. Well, I'm gonna ask all of you to keep your mics open and I'm gonna ask you to sort of just raise your hand if you wanna uh, jump in here. What is the kind of collaboration you think you will need and can get from the private sector to get to the kind of goals you're talking about? Who wants to tackle that? Okay, Go ahead, Senator Pinsky and then Senator Bar uh, uh, Delegate Barbe. Yeah, let, let me start. Thank you, Kathleen. Look, we're, we're going to have to change the paradigm. We're, we're, we're going to have to get out of our comfort zones. You know, if, if we're going to shift uh, new construction to electric so we can rely on solar and wind and geothermal rather than the polluting uh, coal, oil, natural gas, we're going to have to change how we do business. But it can be done. It's been done all over the country. It's been done to the Empire State Building when they renovated there. So I, I think... You know, we want to move out of the comfort zone, but we don't want to put people out of business. And I think we can we can we can thread that needle and and find the solution that pushes us to change how we do business. You know, I, I've learned over the years, if you tell an architect they have to do plans a certain way, they'll do plans a certain way. If you tell the construction crew they have to build a certain way, they will do it. So it comes to us after conversation with the private sector builders, uh, developers, for example that starting in year X, we want to change how you build your buildings. And as long as it doesn't add uh, a more than a marginal cost, we're going to expect it to be done. You know, and, and I think and whether it's how the state orders automobiles and purchases electric vehicles, you know, everyone gets very comfortable in how they do business. People like the status quo. People don't like change in the bureaucracy. So we're going to have to move that everyone, public sector, private sector, a little uncomfortable, not to the point where they can't do what we need to do, but where they're going to have to stretch what they do, where it might cost an extra percent or percent and a half. And we don't, again, want to want to close down the economy of Maryland. We want to make sure they're good quality jobs. We want to have a robust union movement. We want to build a union movement in the state of Maryland, not decrease it. So I think as partners with the labor movement, with the private sector, for example, building construction, you know, uh, there are a lot of great efforts going on where people are being creative. You know, this was a public entity, but Hollabird uh, Middle School in East Baltimore just bought a carbon neutral school, totally carbon neutral in 2021. They have geothermal, they have heat pumps. It's terrific. It can be done. We have to show them it can be done. We have to encourage them to do it. Delegate Barve, do you use tax incentives? Do you use regulatory mandates? What, what is the right approach to, to do that? Well, really, it's an all of the above approach. But I, I want to just, since I'm an accountant, let me just talk about this a little bit. Um, there are trade-offs. I mean, a lot of these programs will cause upfront cost increases, and they'll be paid for by, um, you know, by reductions in expenses in the out years. We, we have an example in Montgomery County of an instance where the uh, a school is being built without geothermal because they didn't want to relocate a ball field for one year. And the unfortunate thing about this is that they are giving up a system that would pay for itself in seven years and save $16 million over 30 years because they don't want to have their teams play on a different ball field for one year. The question I guess we have to ask ourselves is what exactly are we teaching our children when we make decisions like this? And I, unfortunately, too often, even in government, even in Montgomery County, people don't stop and ask the critical question of what's the best way to build this building? What's the best way to insulate it? Uh, what are the best ways to plan communities so that we can take advantage of more, uh, we can have more walkability and have greater uh, uh, transit opportunities for our, for our citizens. I mean, I'm very fortunate. I um, live here in Rockville, Maryland, and we're in the middle of Rockville Town Center. 
And while it's unusual for me and my wife not to own a house at this point in our lives, we love being able to walk everywhere. And we love being able to walk to the metro to go downtown or go, uh, go uh, north if we want to. And these are the kinds of mindsets that we have to really get into. I mean, this goes a little beyond the climate solutions bills that we're considering for next year. I think we have to completely rethink how we build our communities. And the, and the irony in all of this is that when you do it properly, uh, you'll have more opportunities to drive if you want to, because fewer people will be doing that, and you'll be spending less money. I mean, um, my my wife is driving an electric car. We both are, and um, her, she's got fifty thousand miles on it. There's been zero maintenance, and the cost of the actual fuel is less than one fifth of what it would have been if she'd had a comparable vehicle that drove on gasoline, but you know what? It was a more expensive vehicle and we can afford that. Tax incentives uh, have to be a part of the mix. And I'll, I'll just leave you with this though. With every year, all these technologies are getting more and more affordable. And Bloomberg New Energy Finance calculates that by 2027 or so, in the case of electric vehicles, electric vehicles will be the same price as their gasoline uh, counterparts. And at that point, we better have a lot of charging stations available. <laughs> I'm gonna um, can I just say one thing? Can, oh, okay. Just one I, thing I, I think that, actually, okay, go, go ahead. ahead. There's one I thing I think say, that's being left out. We keep talking about businesses based on the ones that exist now. And I think that's a big mistake. We haven't really been having a conversation about how do we nurture these new businesses to be based in, Bal in Baltimore or, or across Maryland. We have this robust higher education center and we invest so much in research and development for health and other things that are really important. But in this conversation, we're not incentivizing the establishment and the siting of these clean energy technology companies here. That's the part of the, the business landscape, not just the existing businesses. Right, so that kind of goes to my next question, um, Delegate Smith, because I think, you know, we talked about the shift from uh, gas and coal to electricity, um, uh, renewables, wind, solar. Um, and so maybe two of you can tackle this idea of how do you deal with the job displacement? And then how do you actually deal with the training for the new economy that you're creating? Who, who wants to, to, you want to jump in on that, Senator yeah, Washington? I do want to jump in because one of the things that I think is often, um, when we talk about higher education, we tend to kind of default to four-year colleges as what's in our mind when we're having those conversations. And that's a big mistake. The majority of Americans will, at some point, um, receive education from our community college system. And they're, to me, going to be on the front lines of ensuring that people have the skills needed to pivot to some of these clean jobs that we're talking about. Every job that's going to take us into a, a more climate, um, you know, um, conscious, you know, economy is actually not going to necessarily require a four-year degree. It's going to require a certain set of discrete skills that can be gained through um, certain type of um, certificate programs and things that are short of a degree, but show that you are um, employable and, and, and functions that are very um, important to creating more um, energy efficient buildings, for example. Um, also, we're going to have to have um, many more professionals trained around emergency response. And there's a great intersection between climate change and emergency response. Um, no matter the threat, whether it's a one posed by extreme weather or one posed by a pandemic, the same things need to be met. People need to be fed. People need access to generation generators for keeping medic, medication cold, you know, all these different things. So I just think that the community colleges are going to be on the front lines of creating a cadre of professionals that are not only coming out of high school, but are reimagining their careers at any age. Uh, Senator Washington, why don't you kind of amplify that a little bit? <laughs> that's exactly what I Because I know you were about to jump in, too. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's fine. She, she, she always does a, a better job. Um, but I do think the framing is really important. Uh, we as Democrats, we as environmentalists um, have to frame, resist the frame of uh, us against them, uh, that it is about growing, that it is about um, uh, that there already are businesses that are choosing uh, to do uh, what makes sense uh, for the environment, uh, but also it makes business sense. Uh, planting uh, 5 million trees, that's jobs. Um, you know, uh, the, the uh, public works uh, officials uh, in Baltimore, in order to begin to really address the stormwater challenges, is they're gonna conduct like the first survey of all the drain pipes uh, in the city. And that hasn't been done in like 40 years. 
imagine the number of firms and individuals that are and and and, and jobs that uh, can be created by this. So I think our focus should be about what does this these jobs create and what there are opportunities. And as Delegate uh, Smith said, to make sure that our community colleges um, are a part of training or in retraining that's uh, that needs to occur. Sarah, Senator Al Alfreth, I, I see you kind of leaning in on this one too. I, I, it sounds like you have something to say. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to cut off Chair Barbara. I'll just say, I, you know, it, it is a false premise that we have to choose between like our one, two of our most important democratic ideals, which is labor and family sustaining jobs and the environment. And you know, it's not, it's not simple. It's not easy. I'm not implying it is, but bringing folk, those groups to the table. And, and I think it was done very well in clean energy jobs. And to Delegate Smith's point, really being proactive in what is the workforce need of the future or how do we even kind of push it in that right direction, utilizing our incredibly um, qualified and affordable community colleges. That's that's the real work ahead. But I know Delegate Barve is, is itching to jump in. Yeah, I, I wanna kind of push back on this notion that technology destroys jobs because that's never been the experience in the 200 year history of the United States of America. We have, we started out with 5 million people and totally non-industrialized and we have 330 million people today and lots of uh, lots of uh, innovation and uh, and uh, and automation let me just say this if you drive an electric vehicle for example and you're saving four or five thousand uh, two or three thousand dollars a year on gasoline it means that you have two or three thousand dollars every year to buy other stuff which means there is no zero sum. It's, it, it, you know, there, somebody is going to be a winner. Uh, that's the way the marketplace operates. And the fact of the matter is, it's true. I mean, if you're in the oil and gas industry right now, you need to start thinking about your next career move. You, you do need to start thinking about that. Uh, on the other hand, there are a lot of union, uh, union jobs uh, in electric power generation. And uh, there are a lot of high paying jobs that may not be union in other industries. You know, if, if we're concerned about what people are paid, the way to really focus on that is to support labor unions, support a higher minimum wage, because, you know, these new technologies for them to actually succeed, they're gonna succeed because they save consumers money and consumers are going to spend that money on other stuff. And so I, I just wanna push back on the notion that this technological innovation is assumed to cost jobs because it's never been that, that way in American history up until now. And Kathleen, so I'm going to pop in here other. with a couple of questions from our audience, if I can, uh, quickly, and I'll get, you know, some of you to help me answer these, um, because obviously we're going into a, an election year, we're going to have a big gubernatorial race, um, the Democrats are going to win the governorship back, but uh, we've got a year of uh, Larry Hogan as governor of Maryland. So if the House and Senate agree, one of the uh, 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 viewers is asking, um, uh, can a, uh, and they pass a big comprehensive climate bill this year, is it likely that Governor Hogan will veto it? Um, does that mean the bill must be passed early enough in the session so that that veto can be overridden uh, before the session ends? What is the political strategy? You've talked about collaborating. So uh, yes, yeah, Senator Pinsky, why don't you tell us what the political strategy of this will be vis-a-vis -vis the governor? No, th that's a very important question, Kathleen. And, and I think both chambers see this as a high priority, are gonna take it up early in session and we will pass it early enough that'll give the time for the governor to veto it and we can override the veto. And, and I think yeah. in the last seven years, the governor has dragged his feet. The Department of the Environment has dragged his feet. There was an article today in the Baltimore Sun about uh, drinking water. I mean, this has been the constant from the administration. And I think th this is the issue of climate as well as others can be a line in the sand. I, I think it's something that the Democratic Party and whoever the gubernatorial candidate is can run on and and look. I hope Governor Hogan supports the bill, but I'm not going to bet the house on it. Uh, my guess is he will veto it. Um, and his administration, the, his Department of Commerce, his secretary there, they will all get behind it because some part of the bill they won't be happy with. So we're going to move forward. We're going to do it in such a way that we can override because, as as uh, Chairman Barve always points out, we're in the fourth year of a session, so you can't wait. We can't wait till next session, the following session, for two reasons. 
One, we simply can't wait. It's a, too an important an issue. And secondly, you have to start over because you have a new legislature. So right. we'll get it done early enough. He will have his up to 10 days to look at it and review it. And then we're ready to have enough votes to override it. This is very important. It can't wait. The governor has not been an asset. He's been a liability. So is his administration. It's time for the Democrats to take over. Great. Here's another question. Can someone speak specifically to the provisions um, in bills that are being proposed with respect to moving schools to net zero? Well, um, let me just say that that's that it is always a goal that Senator Pinsky and I have of being the change that we want to see. But the problem is there are a lot of jurisdictions that will push back on this. And by a lot, I mean all 24 of them. Uh, there are a lot of jurisdictions that are going to push back on the notion of even increasing the cost of a school one nickel. And so, I, you know, I really want to am amplify the point that Senator Pinsky made. There are a lot of building practices and a lot of strategies that can be employed that don't have that much of an impact upon the first dollar of cost. And most of these school systems simply don't believe it. They don't want to investigate it. And one of our uh, one of our objectives, and I forgive me if I'm speaking for you, Senator Pinsky, one of our objectives is to see to it that they have to actually do the analysis in an intelligent fashion. There are a lot of buildings that are being built uh, very with a really tight um, insulation envelope, and the additional costs are in the range of one or two percent. And unfortunately, there are just an awful lot of um, an awful lot of school systems. <laughs> all of them almost in our state who just don't believe that so they don't even bother to try and that that is an education policy objective that the senate and the house have share in common and several of you go ahead also i just want to say that there's also on on this uh, effort to make schools net zero there's there's also an opportunity to improve the learning environment for the children when we visit these schools mm -hmm. there's more light uh, there, uh, there are opportunities for the children to go indoors and outdoors. They are engaging in their communities in this really exciting and important way. So when we talk to uh, school districts, it's not simply about facilities. It really is about improving uh, the quality of education. And what we're hearing anecdotally is that there are decreases in so-called behavior problems uh, because of the openness. Uh, that children want to go to school. So I think there's some other, uh, so this is not simply an environmental policy, but I actually believe that it makes good sense in terms of improving the conditions in our schools and certainly with COVID and, and airflow. Like there's just lots of things that, you know, doing a lot of the practices that net zero uh, schools um, um, uh, can create uh, really is for the benefit of, of the children and um, makes it a, more, a, a better working and learning. Let me try two more questions from our audience. Um, uh, several of you talked about sort of the disproportionate impact of climate change on low-income communities. And um, somebody's asking, what bills do you have that help low-income families tra uh, transition to electric homes, um, uh, you know, uh, adopt um, uh, good health and safety remediation to weatherize, uh, helping them do the structural work to make their uh, homes um, you know, better uh, energy conservation um, habitats. Does anybody want to tackle that? Yeah, um, Kathleen, I'll, I'll try to tackle that. We already have in place uh, some incentives in the state to encourage insulation, air sealing to make buildings much more energy efficient, which of course, it, it means that not only is it, a, it, is it a healthier place for children to grow up in, but it's it's less expensive. The utility cost goes down significantly. But what we need to do to get to our future in which we have 50, 60% reduction in emissions and eventually net zero is provide incentives so that all households are able to take advantage of the opportunity to electrify their heating systems. For example, if they've got old oil furnaces or even more, more recent gas, gas fired burners, they create much more fossil fuel emissions. And so we need to create more incentives so that everyone is able to transition to, to an electric, electric form of power source, not just for the lights, but also for, for their heat. So that's something that, that
that we're working on that, and that hopefully will be in our legislation next year. And are there any uh, um, current or um, uh, kind of proposed financial tax incentives, other incentives for companies um, in certain industries to meet these environmental goals? Do you want to talk about that as well for business to actually meet these goals? Yes. I mean, what, I mean, two sort of main pillars of the recommendations for getting to our building sector to net zero when it comes to direct building emissions are Number one, electrification for all new buildings. Um, now, when it comes to uh, residences, it's already been established that not only is it cheaper to not only cheaper to build an all electric home, but it's cheaper to operate it. When it comes to commercial buildings, the the results are are more mixed. And certainly, when it comes to retrofitting older buildings, especially ones that might have been built 30, 40, 50 years ago. It's expensive to do that type of retrofit to get to systems that are all electric. And so in that area, um, we, ne we need to look at some incentives so that if the cost equation is not clear that shifting, say, from you know, oil-based sys heating system to all electric is economical, can, can get a return within, say, you know, 10 to 15 years, then we need to look at uh, providing subsidies where a company can make a clear case that yeah, they want to go electric, they want to be energy efficient, but it they may need some incentive to do that. I know from my experience uh, at Marriott, where I worked for 10 years, to, to be honest, one of the biggest incentives for um, adopting a global green policy and a strong uh, sustainability policy is you attract young employees who want to work for a company that goes green. Number two, you save money in a lot of the, the things you do. And so there are built-in incentives beyond what the state or federal government can do uh, that make this good business sense for a lot of these companies. Yeah, go ahead, Senator yeah. Washington. And, and I just want to add incentivizing community solar uh, and other programs specifically for, uh, for clean energy, low cost energy for low and moderate income Marylanders. We, we absolutely uh, can do more to do that. So in addition to our, uh, our businesses, we really need community solar uh, can provide a great opportunity uh, to, to both uh, for clean energy and also to reduce costs. I'm so I'm just going to do one final question that. from, go ahead. Let me just do just one saying, final question from our audience, if I can. Uh, people are asking about Metro. You know, Metro uh, just has had such um, uh, negative impact because of, um, you know, the COVID uh, epidemic and people just not taking mass transit. It's had um, safety issues. But people, I think, are still hopeful that there'll be plans to extend our Rapid rail, our our you know our metro system into uh, connecting Baltimore and DC, connecting Annapolis, uh, any Hagerstown, any likelihood of those kinds of things happening? Well, we did pass the Transit Safety and Investment Act, right? That's mandating uh, that there be sufficient fund from the, the Transportation Trust Fund over the next six years to ensure transit system is operational. And then also, I believe there's a Western Maryland Mark Rail Extension Study. Uh, and there, again, could be a real opportunity there to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, nitrous oxides, and, and to get to the job component. If we did that, it would produce twice the number of jobs per dollar than the investments uh, in the roads that the, the current administration is doing. So um, we passed some things um, you know, in the last couple of years. But I hope you move along, but yeah, we need to do Anybody else want to weigh in on that? Well, then I'm going to go into a lightning round and I'm going to, I, since I stepped on uh, Delegate Smith there, I'm going to start with you because I know you've got a lot to say. In our lightning round, I just would like you to each have a chance in under a minute to actually um, share something that is just bubbling up inside of you that you really want to say about this issue of climate change solutions, or if you want to um, tell the audience what you hope you will be able to have said you did, you accomplished at the end of the session on um, Sine Die, uh, what you think we will be able to say as Democrats in a Democratic legislature was accomplished for the people of Maryland. So Delegate Smith, I'm going to start with you. 
Okay, number one, for the macro, I hope that we can say we have passed comprehensive climate change legislation. That's for all of us. For me, I hope that I'm able to say that I passed legislation that increased access to solar um, power for low to moderate income households. And lastly, something that I hope that we continue to prioritize is the communities that are on the front lines of pollutions, not just climate specifically, but all forms of pollution, because we have a lot to learn from them. And it's also a part of us living up to our, our values, around equity and justice. Thank you. Great. Uh, Delegate Dana Stein, tell me what you hope you'll be able to say was, was accomplished on um, Signy Die. Sure. On a very personal level, I want to be able to tell my daughter who recently said to me, you know, Dad, your generation is, is uh, leaving an environmental mess that we're going to have to clean up. I want to be able to tell her at the end of session that, well, we made a significant step in cleaning up that mess so that the environment and the world that we pass on to them is much more inhabitable. It's not one that's at, at the risk of intensifying floods, droughts, sea level rise, that we're doing our best to fight back that climate change. And I also want Maryland to become a national leader. Uh, you know, many times when it comes to environmental legislation, we look to California or New York or a few other states as the trendsetters. I want Maryland to be at the forefront. I want Maryland to be the state that other legislators look to and say, hey, they passed some really trailblazing legislation. Let's model what we do based on Maryland. We certainly have the ideas, we have the workforce, and I believe we have the will this coming session to do that. Great. Senator Sarah Elfreth, how about you? What would you like to be able to both that the Democrats did on um, uh, at, at the end of this session and any other issues that you wanna make sure that people are focused on as yeah, we go I'll, into your legislative session. I'll say ditto to, to both the delegates, fantastic goals that I share. Um, I, I'd like to say at the end of, of this session that we've made a historic investment in our public parks um, from a resilience perspective, an equity perspective, in a green space. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be big, um, and that we are really on track to preserve forty percent of our state's lands by twenty forty. On a kind of more personal level, I want to be able to look my constituents in the eye um, when I'm up for re-election and say I've put all I I could into you know preparing our district, which is going to be on the front line. Um, for the floods that are ahead. And I'm going to continue to work on that uh, for as long as they'll, they'll have me. Great. Senator Mary Washington, how about you? I, I want to say that we came together uh, in the interest of saving the planet and our state and our children. I want to be able to say uh, to Mrs. Williams that the state is going is investing and in making sure that your, your basement is no longer flooding. Uh, I want to be able to say that we are funding environmental jobs and opportunities for young people in our communities. Um, and that moving forward and beyond, we're, we're gonna continue the momentum. Uh, we're not gonna just make pl uh, plans, we're going to take action. Um, and that we're going to ensure that there's no more polluted stormwater runoff uh, and that our communities are safe. Um, and that as all of my colleagues have said, and I've with everything, um, that we're doing our part to make a historic uh, an important change for the future. Great, thank you. And let me just kind of wrap with our two committee chairmen, um, Delegate Barve. Um, well, uh, you know, tell me. I mean, the, you know, the, these we're, we're talking about important legacies too for many, many of you um, sure. uh, who have been at this business for a long, long time. Yeah, I mean, uh, the state of Maryland has been a leader for many decades. Paul Pinsky and I and others have been leading on the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act of uh, 20, uh, 2009, 2016. We functionally banned offshore oil drilling. We banned frack. We're one of the few states in the un union that has natural gas to ban fracking. So we have a long history of leadership, and we're going to continue that this year as well. But I think it's important for everybody to understand that this isn't the end of a conversation. It's really just the beginning of, of a conversation. And, you know, I, I think it's incumbent upon us as environmentalists to look for the cheapest ways to produce clean energy. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's very doable, but it means that in many cases, we're going to have to put aside some objections we've had. And in Montgomery County, the county council uh, basically functionally banned uh, community solar because of some activists. We can't be doing that. I mean, if you want green electrons, they have to be 
they have to come from somewhere. And, uh, you know, so we have to actually find the electrons that are carbon free and generate them within our state. There's plenty of room to do all of that without harming any of our uh, rural interests. Great. And Senator Paul Pinsky. Thank you, Kathleen. First, I, you know, we want to pass the Climate Solutions Now Act, and, and it's unique in that it sets broad goals, 60% reduction, but it also creates concrete actions, not just talk, because we, we hope to have a Democratic governor, but we have to hold who's ever in office accountable. We have to force them to take actions that change our practices and our behaviors. But I, I want to concur with uh, Chairman Barve. Uh, this is the beginning. You know, we have to show the urgency, but, you know, mass transit, I mean, that's an issue we have to take up next year. We have to get people out of their cars. We have to have a system that functions in Baltimore, whether it's red line or expansion. We need to connect Charles County so people from Charles County and Waldorf can get into DC. It's got to connect to the metro system. We have to finish the purple line. You know, we have to look askance when the governor says we have to build more roads and put more cars on, on, on the roads. And actually in the Department of the Environment's plan, they actually asserted that having toll lanes would reduce emissions. Putting more cars on the roads would reduce emissions. Now they say cars would idle less, but if you put 10 or 20 or 50,000 cars on the road, it's an abomination. So we have to continue changing the culture. It's the beginning of the conversation, not the end of the conversation. Great, well, I wanna thank um, our incredible um, group of panelists. Uh, you've all been terrific. As I introduced you at the beginning in alphabetical order, I will thank you in alphabetical order. Delegate Barve, Senator Alfred, Senator Paul Pinsky, Delegate Smith, Delegate Stein, and Senator Mary Washington. Thank you so much. You really have talked about sort of transformational climate investments, uh, putting Maryland out there first as a role model for other states working collaboratively, which is so important, uh, and actually to make the pivot, political pivot, running on issues that matter and are really critical to our state and will make a difference in people's lives and I think are winning issues in the 2022 elections for all of you uh, and for our governors who are our gubernatorial candidates who are gonna be running. So I know that that is why Yvette Lewis is smiling <laughs> because that is really um, where she wants to be as a party where we are actually delivering and we will be building it back better. So Yvette, I'm gonna turn it back to you. I, I really am honored to be part of this panel and so proud to have these people representing all of us. Thank you so much, uh, Kathleen. And I have to tell you, um, I'll, I've said it before, I'll say it again. A panel, a forum is only as good as the moderator. Kathleen, you did a fantastic <laughs> job. Thank you so much. And thank My you pleasure. every single one of our panelists for joining us tonight for this important and informative conversation. I could tell by the comments that people had on Facebook that they truly, truly enjoyed every single thing that you had to say. I know we're all looking forward to our upcoming uh, session to see the progress that we will continue to make in addressing this very, very important issue. And I, for one, am very pleased and proud that all of you will be there standing strong to represent each and every one of us. So thank you for that. I'd also like to thank our, our sponsors tonight, Ed Hatcher, Angie Cannon, and Arnold Richmond, without whose support this series would not have been possible at all. So thank you all so much. Have a wonderful evening and we'll see you soon. Thanks a lot. <laughs>